Metro is a group of misfits where we believe that our commonality is our weaknesses and our strengths. And because of that, because we've done that, we've experienced the perfect strength of God that allows us to be a church of transformation. That's what Metro is all about. I got something very exciting to share with you today. After 14 years of our church, and many of you have been a part of us for many years, it's time that Metro finds a home. Don't you agree? I believe it is time for us to finally say that we have our own building, our own space. We're no longer just renting, but that we have a place, a permanent place where we're sending a message to the people in our church and outside of our church that we're here to stay and we're not going anywhere. We call this campaign Beyond the Building because we wanted people in our community to realize that this isn't just about building a church building. Sometimes when we think about a church building, we often just confine the church to just the building. But that's so much more than what we're about here at Metro. We feel like we need to bring our sanctuary or our seats, not just in our building, but we need to bring it onto the streets. And that's really what this is about. This building is a place where people from all walks of life, especially here in Englewood and beyond, would come and connect and experience God would experience transformation in their own lives. We're talking in their relationship with God, but with one another, and, and also here in Englewood. And so we really believe this idea of beyond the building, it's allowing us to be reminded this is a relational, a community thing. Metro's always been about a community, and our church has always been about the people. And this building is about the people, and that's why we're doing this. We're not doing this because we just want to build a building and have one to own. We're building this because we feel more than ever in the history of our church, we need to continue to do this because it's about our people, our community here at Metro and our community here in Englewood and even beyond. 14 years, I think it's quite a long time for a church to continue to, to be thriving in. Church experts say that probably more than 75% of most churches fail within the first five years. So 14 years is really, it's really a milestone. And you know, we started with 11 people and it's really been an amazing adventure. And you know, now we're kind of at a place where we're about 800, you know, about 500 adults, maybe a little bit more, and, and about 300 kids or so. When we were smaller, we can just kind of move to whatever space, you know, that was better, or bigger. But now that we're at a certain size, it's hard to find a space that can accommodate us. And so the choices are very limited. Furthermore, we really feel God is leading us to continue to stay here in Englewood. And when you really look at the options here in Englewood, there really is no other option than just kind of where we are right now. And there really isn't any other options in which where we can move to a different space. And so really for us, it's, it's time that we start thinking about building a presence here, a permanent presence, a building would kind of send that message. And for us to be in a building where we can just continue to grow as a church numerically, but also spiritually and even as a community. Currently, we don't have a, a space or a building that we can kind of point you towards and say, here it is and here's what we hope we, we're going to accomplish there through this space. But we're actively looking and searching and praying and we believe that God's going to open up a door for us to find a place. We have some potential prospects, but none right now where we feel certain enough to report to you is we don't want to create false hope. We're actually working with our denomination. We have some real estate people in our church that are helping us. You're going to learn in the next given weeks why we are where we are today, our limitations that we're experiencing as a church, and the robust opportunities that God's giving to us right now that can be experienced if we have our own building. And so in the next few weeks, we're going to take that journey. We're going to look at Englewood, and you're going to hear some stories and learn about our opportunities that God's given to us here. You're going to look at opportunities where God's given to us here as a church community. God's been real faithful to just kind of bringing people. And it's not just about the number, but really it's about the life and the vitality that we've been able to experience in the past 14 years. We started with 11, and there was still life in that 11 people that were a part of the church. But now you see what God's doing with the 8900, and you see the life that's growing there, and it's really an amazing experience.
and you're going to learn what are the exciting opportunities that God has placed before us that we as a church have to learn to be faithful to doing together. yourself for the next few weeks of this campaign, I really need you to pray. I know you hear me say that a lot on Sundays, but you really need to take that seriously because you need to ask God how you can participate in being a part of this. And part of that participation, a big part of that through our community is how much you can give to this. I need you to pray. I need you to be informed. We have a lot of literature. Don't just take it home and throw it away in the garbage. Take it home, read through every page, every word, and submit that in prayer to God and let God speak to you. And if you allow God to speak to you as your pastor, that's all I care about. And there you have it. Uh, this is sort of this historic moment for the history of our church. And I don't know about you, but uh, my bandwidth is about this big these days. And uh, I think this morning as I woke up, uh, I felt the weight of what this day is all about for the history of our church. And uh, it's a lot bigger than any one of us in this room, including myself. And uh, if you are to be open to the next six weeks, to potentially what God may want to speak to you about, it's a privilege when God speaks to you. It is. And very seldom do we actually live a life where God speaks to us regularly, but we're going to try to position you in the next six weeks where you can listen to God's voice. And then if we can be obedient as a church together, something amazing is going to happen in our church. And we're not going to live just these ordinary days that we're going to experience in the next several weeks here, in the next six weeks. These are going to be extraordinary days for the history of our church. And Ordinary days are just days that kind of you and I never really remember because they're just routine, isn't it? It's just not memorable. But extraordinary days will grip you. Extraordinary days will almost feel like time just kind of stops. And you'll never forget those moments. You'll never forget where you were, what you were doing when you experienced an extraordinary day. Every single one of you, if I were to ask you where you were on 9-11, September 11th, you would know where you were, what you were doing on that day. You would. I was in California and I was in seminary my first year and I was sleeping. My roommate, not my roommate, not my wife, my roommate, my friend <laughs> in school, he knew, he knew I was from New York. He calls me and he says, hey, you got to turn on the TV. And I did and I was horrified to see what I saw. You all remember that because that wasn't an ordinary day. If you're kind of old like me, uh, or you're older like me, uh, you remember when the space shuttle blew up? Challenger, and it was a, there was a teacher, and I was in sixth grade, I was in my class, and uh, somebody came to the door and knocked, and I saw my teacher, Mr. Barone, and they said that the space shuttle blew up, and I just remember his face, the shock on his face that the space shuttle blew up with a teacher inside of it. It was horrifying, and if you're older than me, Many of you remember when Martin Luther King was shot. It was kind of like a punch in the gut. It was like just time just stood still. And those are days we'll never forget. I still remember the day and where my wife and I, we were back in uh, seminary uh, in my first year. Uh, my wife was pregnant and on September uh, 25th, <laughs> oof, man, 2001, we attended Friday night Bible study and then we came back, and she started, she was pregnant with Christina, and she started to feel the pains. We called our doctor, and he said, go to the hospital. It's time. And we went. And I'll never forget it. We were there for a long time, for about almost an evening, and then we had her in the afternoon. And it was just a miracle of life. I'll never forget the day that my firstborn came into this world. 
Never forget it. There she is. There's mom, brutaling through an, almost a day's worth of labor. But she was here. Those were no ordinary days. And I'm here to tell you in the next six weeks, we're not going to just be, be coming here on Sundays and going through our daily life in ordinary ways. Now, you can choose to do that, and that's up to you. But my hope and prayer is that you would come on and jump on to this. And the next six weeks, that you would believe that if we can come together as a community, that we can live in extraordinary days for the future and the history of our church. That's my hope for us for the next six weeks. And so I implore you that you would be open to God, because if the end, let God speak. That's all I care about. That's all we care about as a church. And what you find is that we're going to study the book of Nehemiah. And didn't Pastor Alex do a great job last Sunday just launching us into that sermon series? And uh, Nehemiah is a character in the Bible that I hope that you and I would be very familiar with. Because if we can learn to be a bit more like Nehemiah, you're going to have more extraordinary days than ordinary days in your life. And I think when we, it's so easy for us living here in America, for us to live in this routine of the ordinary. You know what you're going to do tomorrow. You're going to go to bed. Most of you are going to wake up in the morning and you're going to go to work. It's routine. But with Nehemiah, he was just encountering these ordinary days. He was a cupbearer to the king. We're going to dissect what that means. And there was just this one day that was absolutely extraordinary. He received some news that changed the trajectory of his life forever. And it changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of Israelites forever. Because he heard about something. And this one day, which was supposed to be ordinary for him, was absolutely extraordinary. My hope for you today is that today will be an opportunity where God would invite you and me to enter into days for the next six weeks, to enter into days where it's not going to be ordinary for us, that we would see a unification of our church, brothers and sisters in Christ come together, and there will be such a unity here, and that through that unity, something extraordinary is going to happen. And so what is this thing that happened to Nehemiah that changed the trajectory of his life where no longer did he wake up and know exactly what was going to happen? where his life wasn't just ordinary, but it was absolutely extraordinary. Uh, we're going to talk about that. But before we do it, I want to just kind of enter into a time of prayer. And I don't know about you, but like I said that before we started, my bandwidth is about this big these days. I was able to spend some time in silence yesterday and today, and it really made a difference. And so can I just kind of ask if we can just be in a place of utter silence? Everyone in the nursery, I know that's probably an impossibility, but can we just be in a place of silence for about a minute? I want you to slow down, and I want you to center on God. I need you to find an anchor word, because even in those 60 seconds, your mind is going to go someplace else. Find an anchor word like hallelujah or Jesus or whatever it is to get you grounded and centered back on Jesus, because this is just that important, that we're grounded and we're centered in Jesus. So I'm going to give us a minute of silence. And then I'm going to lead us in prayer. We're going to get started into this where we got a lot to talk about today. So let's just be silent for just one minute. God, none of us in this room is worthy to live out the vision that you have given to this church. We've fallen, all of us, so short of it. And yet, God, you would choose to still call people like us to go beyond and do greater things than we could ever imagine to do. Thank you for Nehemiah. As we look at this book for the next six weeks, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us whether in a quiet, still voice through silence, whether through a storm in our lives, whatever it might be, we ask that you would speak to us. You would unify our community and that we would not forget the mission that you call our church to do and to be. So God, I pray that the words that come out of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, God, I pray that it would be pleasing unto you it is in your name that we pray. And all of God's people said, 
Amen. Well, just to give you a little background to the book of Nehemiah before we get into the text, Nehemiah lived about 450 years before Jesus Christ was alive. All right, he lived in the kingdom of Persia. He was a Jewish man, and uh, he was a cupbearer to the king. All right, he was a cupbearer to the king. And Nehemiah, like all Jewish people during those days, unfortunately, didn't go to Persia on their own. They were a part of the exile, all right? They were part of the exile. Just to give you a little bit of of history, back in the Old Testament, about 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon entered into Jerusalem, defeated Jerusalem, destroyed the city. It lied in literally utter ruins. As a result of that, he also took the people and they were exiled to Babylon. As a result of that, they were now, the people of God were now living there. And it says in the Bible that God had told the people of God, you're going to be stuck here for the next 70 years. Babylon eventually was conquered by the Medes, and then the Medes was conquered by the Persian Empire, and King Artaxerxes is the king. And Nehemiah at this time worked for King Artaxerxes. He was a cupbearer to the king. Basically, he was a secret servant's agent. All right, he wouldn't take a bullet because they didn't have bullets back then for the king, but he would taste the wine. And back in those days, sometimes it wasn't unusual for people to try to poison and, and kill the king. And so Nehemiah's job was to drink wine, and I'm sure it was the finest wine money could buy. He drank the wine, and if it was poison, he would gladly die for the king. That was his job. It was a very high position because only the king, only uh, somebody who possessed that position would be somebody that the king truly trusted with his life. And for a foreigner to receive such a title and to work in that place was truly a very high esteemed position for Nehemiah. All right, it really was. But then in 445 BC, Nehemiah had lived many days that were ordinary. It was routine, it was predictable, it was just ordinary. But then in 445 BC, he gets news that was just kind of like a punch in the gut, and it absolutely destroys and breaks him. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. The truth is, Nehemiah wasn't even born in Jerusalem. He was born in Persia. It wasn't even his community, but it was his people that he never forgot. And he heard this news, and it broke Nehemiah so much that he actually needed to do something about it, all right? That's what happened. And, uh, you know, our church, we celebrated 14 years of existence back in Easter this year, and it was just such a great celebration. Easter service was amazing. But we've been here for the past 14 years, and as you watch in the video, we started with just 11 people. We were so small. We started in a living room in Hackensack, New Jersey, and I remember at the time my brother-in-law won, and uh, he said to me, he said, man, your church is so small. He was an atheist, didn't believe in God. He said, it's so small, I'm just going to come and be a part of it because I, I just feel bad for you. <laughs> And he said to me, he said, I'm going to wait till the church gets to 50 people. Once you get to 50, I'm out because I don't even believe in Jesus. And so I said, thank you. I need all the people I can get. And so he joined us. We got to 50 eventually, but he never left. In fact, he gave his life to the Lord. And one of the great privileges I had, one of my highlights in ministry was that I was able, I was actually able to baptize him at one of our summer retreats. And then he eventually met his wife, Anna, at our church. And she now leads the nursery ministry. So let's parents in the nursery. Let's give it up for Anna for leading us in that ministry. He definitely married up, and so we're thankful for that. He served the church, and he found a wife in the process. What a blessing. But that history of our church in 2004, our first preview service with this 11 group of people, we started this, and 67 people came out to our first preview service in a snowstorm. We started at the Fort Lee Athletic Club. It was a tiny little old decrepit facility. And uh, Pastor Shirley was leading Metro Kids in a bar. 
You should have seen. It was in a basement in a cellar. She would put shower curtains over the drinks and all that kind of stuff. She would hide things so the kid's first word wouldn't be Budweiser, okay? (laughs) She hid all that thing, and she did the best we could. Christina was the very first person in Metro Kids. And she, and she was there, surely did the best she could. We outgrew that space so quickly. Then we moved into the Crown Plaza Hotel in Englewood. And uh, it was called Radisson Hotel back in our day. And it was like the perfect location for us. We were in there and God just started growing our church. And we were sort of over 100 people started coming out every Sunday. And it was just such a blessing. But then after about a year's time, the hotel manager said, we got to raise the rent. And I said, how much? It was three times more than we paid every Sunday. And I said, well, we can't afford that. And so then we looked, we prayed, we looked, and the only facility we were able to find was the Fort Lee Jewish Community Center. So we moved back to Fort Lee. And the rabbi said, you can only have your service, the earliest is 1 p.m. I thought, well, that's not too bad, 11 to 1, it's only two hours, our people will stay. So we did, we moved, and they didn't stay. It almost destroyed our church. It was so like a, I, I was shocked that two hours of a service change would make a difference, and we were starting to shrink well under 100. And there was this one Sunday, I think, I guess I looked sad or something. I went home, and I got a phone call from a church member, and he just said, hey, Pastor Peter, I just want you to know I believe in the vision of this church. I love Metro. He says, I will never leave this season. And I said, thank you. That was like the best thing he could share with me. He's no longer a part of our church anymore, but you know what? He was there and he supported me and his, his, his call made all the difference in the world. He left many years later, job, had to move away. I knew we had to get out of Fort Lee. I knew we had to get out of the Jewish community center. It wasn't working out for us. And so I started calling different school systems in different towns. And I said, let's try Engle. We had such a great a year in Englewood. And so I called and they said, yeah, try, look at Lincoln Elementary School and let us know what you think. And I went down and I couldn't believe it. It was like a perfect space for us. It was an elementary school. It was old, but it was perfect for us. And so we moved there for a few years and God just started growing our church again. We had to go to second service and, uh, and it was just such a blessing. And then finally Greco opened up and we moved. They, the city sold Lincoln to, the Board of Ed sold the Lincoln Elementary School to the city. And so we moved to Greco. We've been here for the past 10 years, and it's been amazing. God took this little church of just a handful of people, and every Sunday we are about 800 people. And when we moved to Englewood, God said so clearly to us in our leadership that this is the community that we are to be incarnational. That's what he said, that we are to try to create an incarnational presence here in Englewood. Now, let me just kind of help you to understand what incarnation means. Incarnation in its greatest way to, to explain it is that Jesus, God, became human. Right? Through Jesus Christ. God became flesh. And so incarnation means God becoming flesh. And what he had called our church to do from, from once we moved back to Englewood was that we would be an incarnational presence here in Englewood. Meaning, we the people here in this church, that we would be God's flesh to the people here in this city. Amen? That is the vision and the calling that God has placed upon us. And that's what we've never moved out of here. People have said, why don't you move out of Englewood? We can't because we've built so much relational ties with the government, with the school system. We have relationships here. God has called us to be an incarnational presence. And we're not just about moving to different towns and finding a building that will fit us. It's about us creating an incarnational presence, laying an anchor down, saying we are here and we're never going to leave Englewood, New Jersey. That this is the community which God has called us to. And so we're excited about that. And so today we are launching this series called Beyond the Building. And it's time that Metro finds a home. It's time that we find a permanent facility where you and I can have, where we can do ministry here within our church. And there will be no more limitations. And so for the next six weeks, we're going to make history. I believe five, six years from now, maybe ten years from now, we're all going to remember this day. We're all going to remember the series. Say, Remember when you launched the Beyond the Building series? And this was the beginning of God doing something incredible within the life of our church. And not just in the life of our church, but in the life of the city we call Englewood. And so I want you to pay attention. I do want to encourage you to come out every Sunday if you can. If you got these bracelets, let's put it on, all right? A lot of everyone, we want to put on these bracelets for the next six weeks because I want to encourage you to pray. You're going to get some literature And I want to encourage you to read through it, all right? We're going to talk a lot about the campaign in the next six weeks, all right? We're going to have things called the living room events. 
I hope you'll be able to attend if you get an invitation. We're going to have vision events that you're all invited to where you can ask questions if you have questions. But our hope is that in the next six weeks, that as God speaks to you, as God speaks to me, that we would pray and ask how much we can give and contribute to this building fund over the next three years. So that on June 3rd, we would make a pledge as a church individually and that we would share how much we're going to give above and beyond that of our normal giving because we have to, but how much we can give so that we can raise $2.5 million as our goal. Then the next three years that on June 3rd that we would pledge $2.5 million together as a community and that we would be able to use that as a down payment, a 20 to 25% down payment for a building and a facility here in Englewood, New Jersey. I'm asking you that you would be open to making the greatest gift contribution, financial contribution in the history that you've ever made in our church. And I believe in my heart that you will never outgive God and that God will bless you and bless us and will unify as a church even greater as a result of that. Nehemiah receives, receives news and what's happening in Jerusalem. His heart breaks so much. And I want us to understand how can you and I begin to live a little bit more like Nehemiah because this is important. Because if we can't, then we just kind of go through the ebb and flow of life. But how can we be more like Nehemiah? What's some of the things that he did? First, if we're like Nehemiah, the condition of our community here at Metro Community Church is something that we have to care about. Now, if you're a first-time visitor, I'm not necessarily talking to you. But if this is your church, you got to care about our community here at Metro. Amen? We have to care about what's happening here. Look at verse 1. In the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year... While I was in the citadel of Susa, Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disagree and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Here, Nehemiah had a pretty, pretty good job. It was pretty cush. He was living in the palace. He was wearing silk clothing every single day. And yet he hears this news, and he cares about it. It breaks his heart. He could have said, well, you know what? That's sad. I'm going to pray about it. I'll pray about it. All right? God bless these guys in Jerusalem. But he actually cared about what was going on. He wasn't apathetic. He could have been apathetic. But he decided to truly care. And that's the beginning point here. That if you want to be like Nehemiah, and if, you, and if we want to be like Nehemiah as a church, especially now as we embark upon something that we've never done in the history of our church, own our own building, we have to care about what's happening here at Metro Community Church. We do. Every Sunday, we have about 800 people that come out on Sundays, about a little over 500 adults, and almost about 300 kids from babies to high school. It's just amazing. Easter, we had over 1,200 people attend our church on Easter service. And it was just powerful. God did just amazing things. And God just continues to bring more and more people. But I need you to know that we are at absolute maximum capacity as a church here on Sundays. We really can't fit any more people anymore. It's been a burden upon our ministries because at the end of the day, God has called us to do ministry effectively as a church. And we have not been able to do that just simply because we don't have enough room. Remember back in October when I broke my hand? Remember, like, I come to church, I have a cast on, and I'm preaching with this obnoxious cast on my hand? Well, I mean, that is the, there it is. See that cast? I mean, listen, you don't know how hard that was. I had that thing off for like six, seven weeks. I couldn't type, so I had to have my assistant, Steve, type my sermon notes. You know how hard that was for him to do that? I said, I can't. It takes me too long. Can you type it for me? So he did. You know how long it took me to write a sermon? Do you know how hard it was personally for me? I couldn't take a shower by myself. My wife had a wrap, like saran wrap, and put a garbage bag in my hand. And I took a shower with one hand, my left hand, my non-dominant hand, I take a shower with. Man, that's hard. Do you know how hard it was to wipe? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry I'm being gross, but your non-dominant hand? I mean, it just, it would just stretch me beyond my wits. It really did. And yeah, I was able to come on Sundays and still preach and stuff, but I wasn't functioning at full capacity, Metro. I was not. I couldn't. And that's kind of where our church is right now. Yeah, we can just continue to do the ministry that we're doing every Sunday, but we're not functioning at maximum capacity. We're not. Last Sunday, Alex preached an amazing sermon. Everyone was so deeply moved by it. But do you know the nursery didn't get a chance to see it in the first service? Because we, 
always have technological issues, and I hope it's working today, because the school prevents us from hooking up these rooms where we want to so that it actually works technologically. And so I remember just Tim was so frustrated. He just said, listen, man, we need our own building. This is just too much. Every week we got to troubleshoot and try to figure out how can we pipe in the service in that room. And I feel terrible for our parents who came to the first service. They didn't even get a chance to hear Alex's sermon. Our youth group is just growing. It's bursting out of the seams. And our high school ministry, if you don't know this, there isn't a room where they can all congregate on Sunday. So you know what they do? They break up into classrooms with age so that they can just have Bible studies. They can't even come together on a monthly basis together and congregate as a high school youth because we just don't have any space for them. And today is going to be their joint worship service with the junior high. You should go check it out before you leave today. It's standing room only. There's just no room with our junior and our senior high kids coming together for worship service. Our teachers are standing up. It's standing room only. Even if our kids wanted to invite their friends, they couldn't because there's just no room for them. They're not able to do ministry at full capacity. At Metro, we need to care about that. We really do need to care about that. All right, our Metro Kids, Metro Toss, Metro Nursery, all wonderful ministries are at full capacity. Our Sunday services for adults, especially our second service, is at 95% full capacity. And church consultants say that when your church gets to about 70% capacity, you got to go another service or move into another building or bigger facility. Otherwise, you're actually going to stun the growth of your church. Well, we've been at 70% probably for about four or five years. But it's okay. But we're not functioning at maximum capacity. You know how hard it is to find parking space. Our second service is just overwhelming. We tried to go a third service, but none of you came. <laughs> What's up with that, man? But at least you single people would come. Nobody came on Sundays. Third service. We tried. And there's no space in Englewood that can accommodate our church. Now, I know you're saying, well, what about the high school? Yeah, the high school would fit us well, but we're not sacrificing our children. There's no space for them on Sundays. There really isn't. And we're not going to sacrifice our children for the sake of our comfort here at Metro. And so we, this is it. This is the biggest space that we have that could house the entire church from birth to adults. And we're at maximum capacity. Our office space it's just too small for a church of 800. It really is. I mean, it's, it's, it's so sad that, it, did you go to our Holy Week service? We could fit maybe 30, 40, 50 people at most in our office. During our Holy Week service, there were a few days, uh, many days of, of the five days that we had it, where it was standing room only. People couldn't sit. We can't have Holy Week service at our office anymore because we just don't have enough space. So we got to figure out what we're going to do next year with that. Our ministries, we've got to tell a lot of our directors, a lot of our leaders in our church, you can't use our office today because we just don't have enough room. It's at maximum capacity. We are overwhelmed. And for Easter, we had our dance team, our worship team, and our choir practicing for Easter. And you know that the choir had to leave because there was just no room. And they ended up going to somebody else's house, and they practiced there for Easter service. There's just no space. We are so limited in what we do in ministry. And yeah, we can continue to do what we're doing. We can continue to try to do this for many more years. But you know what? We won't be functioning at full capacity. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Peter, but you know, it shouldn't be about the numbers. And I get you. But you and I do not get to tell God how big this church is going to get. Amen? We don't. We don't get to tell God how big this church is going to be. What God has charged us to do is to be faithful to the mission. And if we're going to be a church of transformation, then we need to be a church that can do ministry at full capacity. And right now, we are just not at that place. So God wants us to care the way Nehemiah cared, that he wants us to care about what's happening here and that we would truly care about this, right? And Nehemiah, when he heard that the walls had been broken down, it hurt him. Because, the, you, know, you know that back in those days, the walls were so important for the safety of its community. If you didn't have walls, other people could come and attack you. Countries can come and attack you and destroy you. You watch a lot of those older movies like Lord of the Rings. You watch um, Troy, those movies. The walls were everything. If they did not have walls, they were not a city. If they did not have walls, not only were they in a very precarious situation, they did not have an identity because the walls preserved the identity of their people group. And that's why Hanani said, the people of God are living in utter disgrace right now because not only are the walls ruined, they don't have an identity anymore because there's nothing to fortify their borders and protect them. And so Nehemiah cared about that. 
And what I need you to do in the next six weeks, I need you to pray. And if you don't care, I need you to say, God, could you give me the heart that you have for this church? And can you help me to care about some of the things that are happening in our church community? Nehemiah cared. What was the second thing Nehemiah did? If we're like Nehemiah and if we can be like Nehemiah, the condition of our community is something we will weep about. Not only will we care about it, but we're going to weep about it as well, all right? When I say weep about it, there are some things that are happening in our church that deserves weeping together. But I'm talking also about we have to come together collectively as a church, and we have to weep about what's happening here in Englewood. We have to weep about it. Look at verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. We need to weep the way Nehemiah did. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, but Peter, I don't live in Inglewood. No, I know you don't live in Inglewood. But you know what? Nehemiah didn't live in Jerusalem, but he still wept about it. And Metro Community Church, if this is your church, Inglewood is your community. Amen? Englewood is your Jerusalem. Don't just see it as a location that you come to on Sundays and worship God. No, this is a church. This is our community. And God has called our church that this is the mission field that he wants to serve and love to the best of our abilities. That's what he's called us to be and to do. And so this is your church. We cannot dichotomize where we live residentially to where our church lives here. We cannot dichotomize it. Yes, you live in a community and you can be involved in that, and that's great. But your missional community is where your church is at, and that's here in Englewood. Englewood is a tale of two cities. Some of the most wealthiest and famous people in the world live in Englewood. Do you know that? Some of the greatest homes in Bergen County are not in Alpine, are not even in Englewood Cliffs. They're in Englewood. Do you know Alicia Keys lives in Englewood? <laughs> you know how I know that? Kevin sees her all the time when they walk. You know, she, he walks with his wife, Linda, every day. And he'll see her, and he'll say hi. She says, she's very friendly. I'm like, Kevin invited her to church. Just give her one of our invitation cards. <laughs> he says he'd do it, but then his, the, her bodyguards would just tackle him probably. So I said, okay, you don't have to do that. It's okay. Alicia Keys lives here. You know what house she brought? She brought Eddie Murphy's old house. Eddie Murphy lived in Englewood. I don't know if you know that. Whitney Houston lived in Englewood. All right, before, unfortunately, you know, she, she, uh, she passed away. Sarah Jessica Parker, John Travolta graduated at Dwight Morrow High School here in Englewood. If you don't know that, a little bit of trivia for all of you. Englewood is an amazing city. It's a hub for artists. The Bergen Pack Theater brings artists from all over the world to come and to perform. Artists love to be here in Englewood because it's sort of a hub for artists here. Some great restaurants here in Englewood, aren't there? It's a great place to be. But it's a, there's another story that you need to know about. And with all that opulent wealth and all the advancements that you see in this city, 25% of the population of this city still make less than $25,000 a year. Wrap your mind around that for one moment. In Bergen County, 25% of the residents in this community make less than $25,000 a year. When a family is living in that kind of poverty, the kids struggle in every way. One of the ways that I learned about this a few years ago, that every Friday, the kids in this elementary school, they go home with a snack pack. You know why they do that? Because years ago, they found out these kids were coming to school on Monday with headaches. And so they go to the nurse's office, and the nurse would wonder, what's going on? Why do all these kids have headaches? And they realized that they had no food to eat over the weekend. And so they literally starved themselves. And so what the school did, they said, from now on, every student is going to get a snack pack and go home with it because that might be the only thing that they're going to eat for the weekend until they get back to school. Our heart has to weep for that because this is our community. We're all children of God, amen? And there are children in this community that go home and they can't even eat on the weekends. And sometimes the only meal they'll eat is here in school. Our hearts have to break for that. Because these kids have just the same kind of potential that your kids have today. But they just don't have the opportunity. They just don't have the opportunity. Eighth graders graduate from the school system here. And 39% of these eighth graders meet their expectations in the English language arts in their parks test. 
My son just took a Parks test this week. And you, if you're a parent, you know what the Parks test is. 39% of eighth graders meet the expectations in the English language arts in the park test. That means 61% of these eighth graders are going into high school almost illiterate. They can't read proficiently, they can't write proficiently. You ready for the math? 13% of eighth graders meet the expectations in math in the park test. That means 77% of these kids don't know basic math to go into ninth grade in high school. Our hearts have to weep for that statistic. You know, that 13% wasn't 2016 results. It was 2015. Sunita did all the research. She said the score was so low that the city couldn't publish it because it was even lower than 13%. This is what's happening here in Englewood. We have all the opportunities, all the great things that's happening here. But our heart has to weep the way Nehemiah's heart wept when he heard about the city being in utter ruins, when he heard that the people of God were living in utter disgrace. We, our hearts have to break because these kids are bright. They're smart. Some of them are geniuses. They really are. They just haven't been given the opportunity. These kids could be doctors. They can be lawyers. They can be business people. They can own businesses in Englewood. They can own companies. They can be in the finance field. They can be computer programmers. They just are not given an opportunity because they're living in this community in abject poverty. And God has called us to love and to meet him through, the, through those people. When your hearts weep for that, our hope is, is that this building that we buy and that we one day have of our own, it's not going to be a church. It's going to be a community center for the city of Englewood. We're going to run it. It's going to be called Metro Community Center. From Monday to Saturday, it'll be our programs that we have, all right, of our, of our church. And, uh, and we'll run, and Sunita will lead that charge for us. But did you know that the history of Englewood, they've never had one community center in this city, not one. Now, it's too, I can't go into detail and tell you why that's the case. Just set up a time, and I'll meet with you, and I'll tell you why, but it'll take too long. They've never had a community center in its history. And so we want to build a building. Think about a facility three times the size as this. All right, so for our church, think about a sanctuary. Three times the size of this. Think about, we have, this, we have about 300 chairs here. Think about a sanctuary that can fit 900, okay? But it's be a multi-purpose room so the community could use it as well, all right? Think about everything in here, all the classrooms where all the kids are, three times the size, their office space, three times the size of where we're in now. Think about that. But think about, for this community center, think about a full-size basketball court. I know some of you guys are thinking, you're thinking, ooh, then we could play basketball on Sundays. Absolutely you can, but it's not for you, all right? <laughs> It's not for you primarily. It's for the kids in this city. Pastor Clay does a middle school basketball program, and it struggles here and there because he, we don't have a gym. We have to ask for permission from the school, and they can't give it to us regularly. But he firmly believes that if we had our own gym, we can have 200 to 300 middle schoolers every single day at this program. Because this would be a program. What it will do is that it's not, they're just not going to play basketball they got to do their homework before they play basketball. It's this mentoring kind of a thing that happens. He puts on a three-on-three -three basketball tournament where all the kids from the city come because there's some really great prizes, and they challenge one another, and it's just a great thing. Recreation is going to be a huge way in how we reach the city and the kids here in Englewood. All right, the other area is going to be the arts, arts focus, arts department, arts area. Can you imagine a dance studio? where we could teach kids how to dance and they can just perform. I know our dance ministry will love that and that's great, but it's not for you primarily. It's for the city. Could you imagine like an art studio where kids can learn how to paint and they can do that? Can you imagine a place where kids can learn how to record their own music and they can kind of produce it? I mean, we, the next Alicia Keys could be living here in Englewood. The next Dr. Dre could be here in Englewood to produce some kind of, some great music. How about somebody who can, we, we have a little edit room, and they're so cheap now, you don't need a lot of money to set these things up, where we can teach kids how to shoot on a camera and how to make little short films, and maybe the next Steven Spielberg lives right here in this community, we don't even know about it. And can you imagine every year, once or twice a year, we have an arts day where we invite everyone in the community to come, and they sit like us, and they see these kids dance, they look at their paintings, they watch their movies, their short films, and they listen to their music just perform. Can you imagine how much community that would bring into the city? Education. Education is a huge need here, as you saw the statistics that we just showed you. 
Michael W. Smith, guys, you have no idea the kind of program that he started. He started a Metro Life program many years ago, and Metro Life is an acronym, LIFE, standing for Living in Freedom Every Day. We have a vision in our community center to work with some of the most at-risk youth in Englewood. You know that Englewood sends the highest number of teenagers to juvenile detention centers. I just had a meeting with, um, with the captain and the chief of police, assistant attorney general, and the head prosecutor of Bergen County. And we're talking about the juvenile crime here in Englewood, and it's horrible. It's horrible. And I actually, I share with them what Metro Life is all about. And I said, you know, chief, and, you know, to the attorney general and to the prosecutor, I said, would you guys be open to considering, before you send these kids to a juvenile detention center, would you send them to our program, Metro Life? Would you be open to it? They said, let's talk. We'd be open to it. Because you know what happens when kids go to juvenile detention centers? They're 31 times more likely to go to jail when they get older and they become an adult. We have an opportunity, Metro, to do something. And Michael's put this amazing program together. Honestly, he has. And, uh, and it's life on life, working with these kids, mentoring them in major ways. And we have a guy at our church. His name is Newton. Newton's a Korean-American guy, lives in Tenafly. He's a banker. And he decided to want to be a mentor. You can be, if you want to be a mentor, just volunteer for it. But you got to go through a rigorous screening process. And he just came into my office a few weeks ago. I had no idea he was a mentor. And he just started sharing with me the past two years in how he's been connecting with this kid who played football on the football team. Newton played for f- football for his town. So I guess they paired him up because they both had football in common. And he's just been mentoring him for the past two years. And it's just been fantastic. He found out that the kid never been in a pool before. And so he said, come on over. I got a pool in my house. And so he was swimming and hanging out with the family. They were able to sit down and talk more in depth. And when you're living in poverty, honestly, as a kid, and I I get it because in some ways ways I lived in poverty. You just want to work and make a lot of money, the best you can as a high school student. And so he didn't even care about school. And Newton just sat down there with him for hours talking to him about, yeah, you can do that and drop out of school. I mean, that's obviously an opportunity. That's that's, that's an option. But he says, but if you graduate and you work real hard in school, and though you may not see a lot of money now and go to college and graduate, you'll make a lot more money than you ever could working at minimum wage at a fast food joint. He's going to graduate in June because of that mentorship with Newton. And it's just a major, a great thing. Such a cool thing that happened a few weeks ago. I don't want to say cool, but just something that really touched my heart. One of you in this church, you have employed one of the kids from Metro Life. Astounding. Excellent. Thank you for doing that. Well, this kid had graduated from Metro Life a few years ago. He's still going to college. But I found out a few weeks ago that his father passed away. And so, of course, the person who hired him called me and said, hey, I just want you to know this person's father passed away. And I knew who he was, and so I called Mike, and I said, hey, Michael, this person's father passed away, and I just want him to know so you can reach out to him because he's probably hurting. And Mike said, no, I know. He called me already. I said, really? He said, yeah. I already talked to him. You see, Michael was like an uncle, like a second father to him. And when he lost his dad, one of the first people that he thought about was to call Mike and to reach out to him. These are the opportunities that this community center, metro community center, the areas of recreation, the arts and education that God has called us to be at. And Sunita is leading that with Michael Smith and with Steve Bang, and they're trying to create these programs with Clayton and with different people and with you that we can come together and do something this city's never had before. We can leave a legacy here that will go far beyond our lifetime, that our grandkids would be coming to, a ch- would be coming to Metro, and they'll be able to see what's happened, and we'll say, we all remember that day in 2017, back in late April, when we talked about this. But we got to be willing to weep about what's going on here in this community. Amen? God has called you and me. I don't know why. Remember, Alice got up here last week, and he said, you know, God used somebody that didn't look like me, that didn't even live in my neighborhood, but as a result of it, I came to know Jesus. He's spoken at the White House. He speaks at conferences, sometimes there are about 20,000 people in attendance. There's so much opportunity and potential here, and God's called you and me. He's invited us to have a front row seat in being a part of the lives of these amazing young men and women here in this city. I don't know about you, but that is such an exciting Exciting thing. And so we won't have this church that's just going to be a church building that's only used at full capacity once a week on a Sunday. 
but it will be used at full capacity from Monday through Sunday that God will be doing great things in this facility. The third and last thing, that if we're like Nehemiah, the condition of our community is something we will pray about. We will care about it. We will weep about it. But now we got to pray about it. And so if you have your bands, make sure you, you have your wristbands. Nehemiah prayed. You know how long he prayed for? After he heard this news, I'm going to take you to chapter 2 next Sunday. Then he goes before the king. How many days do you think elapsed through him hearing this news and him weeping and praying and then him going to the king? How many days do you think? Two, three, four, maybe one week, maybe two weeks? Try four months. He fasted and he prayed for four months. And he knew, because it ends by him saying, I was a cupbearer to the king. He says, help me to talk to this man. Because for a cupbearer to go to the king, we're going to talk about this next week, it was a very dangerous proposition. His life was at stake for him to make a request like this. So he prayed. And so for the next 40 days, I'm asking you to sign up before you leave and pray with us. Grab this band and wear it for the next 40 days. You can take a shower with it. And you know it glows in the dark. It's fantastic. <laughs> Glows in the dark. Your kids will love it, all right? But um, be reminded that you stand in solidarity with where God is calling our church and pray. Every single day, there's, Sunita is doing a great job with this. There's something you can pray about, one prayer thing that you can pray for the city, our church about, or the world about. Sign up for that prayer and fasting today. But what was the focus of Nehemiah's prayer? I'm going to go through this really quick because I don't got enough time, all right? What was the focus? There's five focuses of Nehemiah's prayer. The first focus is that he focused on God's goodness all right? He focused on God's goodness. Verse 5. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. This is fantastic. All right? The city of Jerusalem lied in utter ruins, and yet he still thanks God for his goodness. What does that mean? I know for some of you, you came here with very heavy hearts. But we have to always learn to thank God for his goodness. Amen? He's so good to us. Even though Jerusalem lies in utter ruins, he's still so good to us. And you have to be there as a Christian because if, if you sometimes question if God is good in your life, then you're determining your present day circumstances to define who God is in your life. And you have no idea what he did for you through sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you on the cross and resurrect from the dead. You're taking your present day situation to factor in the majority of your understanding and theology of who God is. No, that's a fraction of maybe who God might be. The totality of who he is is that he is good. When you look at what he's done for us in our lives, past, present, and future, our God is good. Nehemiah prayed and thank God for his goodness, even though his city lied in utter ruins and his people were dying. Second, Nehemiah requested God's attentiveness. He requested God's attentiveness. Let your ear, verse 6, be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayers your servant is praying before you day and night for your servant, the people of Israel. He said, God, please be attentive to what I'm going to pray about. And could I just encourage you for the next 40 days as a church, can your major theme in prayer be about us? Be about our building campaign. Now, I, I'm not saying don't pray about any other things, but can you make the focal point of your prayer for the next 40 days as a church? Can you pray for Metro Community Church? Can you pray for Englewood? Can you pray that Alex charged us with last week? God, break my heart for what breaks your heart here in this church at Metro and here in Englewood. Can you ask God to be attentive to that prayer? That's beautiful. That's what Nehemiah did. Third, Nehemiah confessed his sins and the sins of his people, okay? I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. It's important for you to ask God to forgive you of your sins, but it's also important for us to come together corporately and say, God, forgive us corporately for the sins that we've committed against you. All right? Repentance, again, is about making that pivot and walk in the opposite direction of whatever that sin is that you committed or that we committed as a church, that we would walk away and walk away. We need to pray because our sins, our church has committed sins together. We've definitely been more, we've been more apathetic than more empathetic towards what's happening here in our community and here in Englewood, and we got to ask God for that. And so can I just encourage you to come out to our Wednesday evening prayer meetings for the next six weeks at 7.30 p.m.? 
because we're going to come together and the leaders of that ministry will come and we're going to pray for Englewood. We're going to pray for Metro, but we're also going to ask God to forgive us of our sins corporately. I want to encourage you, if Wednesday nights doesn't work, Friday mornings works. Six o'clock in the morning, bam, it's a great time, all right? You can really focus on God. No one's going to call you at 6 a.m. in the morning. Come on out. We're going to pray that God forgive us corporately as a church. We've got to pray and confess. The fourth thing he claimed was God's promise. You've got to claim God's promises. This is a verse 8. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at its farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Nehemiah spoke of God's promises and claimed it for the people of God. You and I can claim the promises that God has put forth in, the, in this church. That as you pray, say, God, we just live into the promise that you started this church 14 years ago, and you want us to continue to be a church of transformation. And he promised us that if we build it, they will come. That he'll bring people to this church. Claim the promises of God for this church. And then the fifth and last thing, Nehemiah asked for God's help. Verse 11, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servant, who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. And the presence of this man means the king, that we would have favor in his eyes. And I'm going to share with you why he had to pray that prayer. But he said, God, I need your help. I can't do this. I really need your help. And I need you guys to join us in the next 40 days. I need you to pray and say, God, help us. Bring our church together. Help us to raise $2.5 million in the next three years. God, we can't do that without you. God, help us to find a facility, a location in this area so kids could walk to after school and be a part of our community center. God, help us. We need to ask God to help us. We need to care. We need to weep. And we need to pray. We need to pray. This story of Tony Campolo has transformed my life. I heard it many years ago when I was in seminary. And I never forgot. I shared it a couple of times here at Metro, but it's so near and dear to my heart because it just, it's what really what we're called to be as a church. Tony Campolo is a very famous evangelist. He speaks all over the world. He was in Hawaii many years ago. He was speaking at a conference. It was late, about 2, 3 in the morning. He couldn't sleep because of the time difference. He was from Philadelphia. And so he was hungry. He got up and he started walking around looking for a place to eat. But what place is open at 2, 3 in the morning? Not too many places. He finds this old diner that was open. It was 24 hours. He walks in there. There's this big Hawaiian dude with a white shirt with a lot of grease on his shirt and a big belly. And, you know, when you go into a place like that and you see the guy who's serving you with a greasy, dirty shirt, you're going to realize his hands are probably even dirtier. So you're not going to order food. He just says, give me coffee and some donuts. And so he grabs coffee and some donuts, and he sits. And um, in walks in a group of women who are prostitutes. And they're sitting around him, and they're being very loud and obnoxious around him. So Tony just wants to eat this donut, drink this coffee, and just go back to his hotel room as fast as possible. And as he was about to do that, the woman that was sitting across from him said to the woman that was sitting next to her, she said, hey, tomorrow is going to be my birthday. I'm going to be 38 years old. And that woman that listened to that, she said, so what? Hey, why are you asking? Why are you telling me this? Do you expect me to buy you a birthday gift? I mean, are you serious? Or do you expect me to throw you a birthday party? Why did you share that with me? And she said, you know what? Don't be so mean. Why are you got to be so mean to me? I just wanted to share it with you because, you know, I had nobody else to share it with. She goes, I don't expect you to buy me a gift, and I certainly don't expect you to throw me a birthday party because nobody has ever thrown me a birthday party in my life. Tony heard that, and he made a decision to do that for her. He stayed there, and when all the ladies left, he went up to Harry, and he said, hey, Harry, uh, these uh, girls, do they come here every day around 3.30 a.m.? He says, every day. He says, that woman that was sitting next to me, what's her name? He says, oh, that's Agnes. He says, it's Agnes's 38th birthday tomorrow. What do you say, you and I throw a big birthday party for her? He says, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. He goes, great. I'll be back here tomorrow. I'll come a little bit earlier. I'll bring all the decorations. I'm going to bring a cake, and we'll celebrate. And he goes, no, you don't. No, 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 no. I'll make the cake. You leave the cake up to me. He says, great. And so Tony comes back the next day at like 2.30, 2.45, 2 
2.45 in the morning, and he said the place was packed. He said every single prostitute in Honolulu must have been in there that day. <laughs> that Harry told everyone that it was Agnes's birthday, right? Tony dresses up the place. The place looks beautiful. Everyone has a happy birthday hat on. He elects himself to be the MC. He's got a big happy birthday sign. And here comes Agnes and her friends walking up to the door at 3.30 in the morning. As they open it, he says to Agnes, happy birthday, Agnes. And Agnes looks at him as if she saw a ghost. Her knees begin to buckle. Her friends have to hold her up. And he says, right this way. And as she walks into the diner, the entire place is singing happy birthday at the top of their lungs. And her eyes begin to get a little watery. She sits down. And then here comes Harry with this massive cake with 38 candles. And he puts it right before her. And then she just loses it. She starts to cry. And then Harry goes, come on, Agnes, blow out the candles. We're hungry. And uh, Harry, not being very sensitive, waits about 15 seconds, and then he blows it out for her. <laughs> and then he hands her a knife, and he goes, cut the cake, Agnes. Cut the cake. And Agnes, just so focused on this cake, he said, Harry, can we eat the cake a little later? I mean, would it be okay if I can just look at this cake a little while longer? And Harry goes, I don't care. If you want to take it home, take it home. And she looks at him. She goes, I can take this home? She says, I only live five minutes away. I'll be right back. She grabs the cake. She holds it like the holy grail. She leaves. The place is dead silent. What does Tony do? He does what any pastor would do. He says, let's pray. <laughs> and so he's praying with all these people in that room. And after he was done, Harry says to him, he goes, hey, you didn't tell me you were a preacher. I mean, what church do you belong to? And in a moment of brilliance, Tony says to him, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. Harry goes, no, you don't. No, you don't. If there was a church like that, I'd go to it. Wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all like to be a part of a church that showed love to people who were so struggling to receive love in their lives? Wouldn't we all love to be a part of a church that would see people the way God sees them, with the opportunities that God has for them, if people like us would come together and believe that we as a community, we can't do this alone, that we can do this together as a community. These next six weeks are going to be groundbreaking in the history of our church. We're going to look back on this day, one day, many years later, and we're going to say, remember when we did this. And my hope for you that during these six weeks is that you will care, you will weep, and you will pray. Spire heads.